start, I just gotta. You know what I'm doing? <laughs> All right, everybody. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Yeah! And then the obligatory. <laughs> ah! Hands up in the air. Woo! Thank you, guys. Let's get that out of the way. All right, so uh, my name is Maya. I live in New York now, but I do spend a lot of time here, so I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. Um, <sighs> all right. I was a pretty weird kid. I mean, I think everybody was a pretty weird kid, right? <sighs> My parents came from Ukraine. Uh, they were immigrants. They were refugees of World War II, and they came over to the United States when they were little kids. So I grew up speaking Ukrainian first, going to Ukrainian school, scouting camps, and my grandmother taught me cross-stitching and all kinds of Ukrainian crafts that go back centuries. Mostly made by women also. Um, so I was in this like really straight-laced, suburban, Baltimore suburb. I call it like a Wonder Bread suburb. And I didn't really get what was happening. I didn't really get like my peer group and stuff. And, uh, and as a first generation American, like I just kind of didn't feel like I fit in. And the one thing that was reinforced to me over and over and over again was that I was an other. And it's true, I was like a total loner. I just like hung out and drew and oh, and I hung out and listened to music, and that's important. And I was a total, total, total freak, but yet somehow still wanted to belong, if that makes sense. And luckily, I found the sort of freaky, weird, activist, queer, recluse weirdos in Baltimore City. And uh, we found each other, I guess you could say. And we would, we would build each other up and we'd work together and we'd make things possible that we never thought could be possible and we would question everything. We didn't have answers and we'd, oh gosh, we, it was like we didn't feel like there'd be any future yet what we were doing felt like it had to be done and it seemed like to me, I mean, the real obvious step from there from this place of belonging in Baltimore City was to move to San Francisco, of course, you know, like the place where they really let that freak flag fly, you know. <laughs> so I moved to San Francisco and I'm starting to see art in ways that I've never seen before, art outside of any of these institutions and museums. It's really cut off from the everyday person and um, it's not graffiti, you know, it's something else. It's like, screws, spray-painted horses, uh, wheat pastes, and uh, like little bits of poetry that other people would add to, and these sort of secret messages, and this communication of this community that I wanted to be a part of, and over time I decided to make my own marks alongside this other anonymous illegal work that was going on, and uh, again, I felt like I really belonged. And during this time in San Francisco, in that beautiful little bubble we lived in, this renaissance happened. A lot of artists started becoming known and discovered, and uh, very quickly, my murals became legal, and they became my passport for traveling the world. And so I did. I mean, of course, it's a dream. This is in Eindhoven, in the Netherlands. This is in New York for a music video for Rai Rai and MIA. This is in Cologne. And this is a huge piece of architecture that uh, was like a big slab. And it looks like a canvas, of course, but really interesting architecture to me is the kind that says something to me and it's asking for something and I 
need to give something back to it. And that's not the case of all architecture. You know, sometimes I'll be like, what do you need? And it's like, nothing. And I'm like, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> I will back away, you know. Um, this one, as many of the other paintings that you're going to be seeing or you're seeing, they're... I don't know what I'm going to do before I start. I, I sort of play off of the environment, the vantage points, how much time I have. And I use uh, house paints and rollers. I used to be a house painter. And so I, these are the tools I know. So uh, I make these big squiggly marks. I sort of stand back and look at it. And I'm like, what do you need? And then I start working in with other colors. And I keep building up, building up, and building up. And those paintings, as I'm painting them, I like to leave every day feeling like it could be finished. You know, it's like, it's in a state, it could look provisional, but it's done. And then that means when I do actually walk away, I still feel like I could keep going, like, forever. And some paintings take, you know, years and years. This is in Perth, Australia, a place I wanted to go forever and was really lucky to. And uh, this is in Rabat, in, Mor in Morocco, um, one of the most incredible places that I was able to visit. <sighs> this is the end result of that painting. And one of the best feelings and stories that came out of this particular mural was that, I mean, most of the places I travel, I speak like a word here and there. I know how to like order a beer or say thank you or excuse me. But I, in Morocco, I really had no common language, especially with my security detail who were Berbers. Like they're, all we knew how to do was this and this and then like, pew, 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 you know, and that was our communication and that was our common language and uh, can't fake that, you know. And one of the other amazing things that came out of this experience was I love pulling all-nighters. I love working all night. I'm one of, those, one of those people that loves to see a sunrise, and it's quieter then. There's different birds chirping. And in this case, I went to the very top on my scissor lift, and the sun was coming up, and the minarets started to go off all around me. And they weren't in synchronicity in any way, but uh, it's... It was pure magic. And this is one of those stories that I have so many of, and this is why I paint. This is probably the largest painting I've ever attempted to paint. It's in Charleroi here, not very far away. <sighs> and we pulled it off. You know, like, there's all these things you never know. You can never plan for. You can have everything totally, like, down, but then you never know what's going to actually happen, like the weather, the uh, technical everything will break. Like, I, mean, I, I trust that it will. I know that it will. I just don't know what it's going to be. I've had assistants that are like, afraid of heights. You know, great. Um, and this is in Copenhagen. Again, like, not exactly following safety standards a lot of the time. Uh, but we were able to like scoot over and get a little cup of coffee from someone who was very pleased about what we were doing. This is Berlin, another scenario where like, everything went wrong. And this was the result. Um, and this is one of my greatest joys is being really, really, really high up on stuff with like a million pounds of safety gear that kind of can ultimately... This is an all-nighter. Yeah, that work can kind of like... All that weight can kind of impede the actual flow of the painting. Um, so Frank Geary was invited to uh, design the new Facebook office in Man uh, Mendocino and... <coughs> South uh, San Francisco a couple years ago, and I was invited to collaborate with him and with the architecture. And he decided to do something that was really progressive and revolutionary and really quite different for Frank Geary. He left all of the exposed beams, these huge cross beams, all the drywall, cement floors, and there was this huge window, top to bottom, about two stories high for this lo lobby that uh, you could see the whole bay and it was changing colors constantly. So using that colorful ribbon, white woven sort of stuff that I do, uh, I created what I see as, as a face and also as that woven exchange of information of Silicon Valley. It's a stretch, but it's in there. Um, and that's how it looked at night. It was quite massive. Okay, so here we are in Brussels now. 
Um, none, of, none of what I'm showing you is really chronological, and I don't think it really matters. Uh, but I will tell you something that happened 10 years ago, just about. I was discovered by a gallery here called Alice Gallery. And I, I didn't know what it meant to be represented, or I felt totally like DIY and stuff. But in walks this woman, Alice. And she gets it, you know, like, she understands, she has this vision, she can see past what I've already been doing, and she can... I guess the easiest way to say it is, she trusts me. And I have this new sense of belonging, again, here in Brussels. So I'm painting inside her gallery, I'm painting outside of her gallery. I start showing in more museums nearby. This is at the Bonifantin Museum in Maastricht. A detail, and more. And this is at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. Ah, uh, this was painted in like eight hours, just sort of made those constraints for myself, played these games with myself to, to do that. And, uh, and while painting in all these museums, it might have just been coincidence, and it might have also just been like what Alice Gallery's vision was, they decided to open their own museum here in Brussels. It's the MIMA in Molenbeek. And they invited me to paint during their inaugural exhibition. Um, I was given the very top floor of this beer brewery. It was shaped like a vessel. It's where they used to store the grains. And we worked for a month, my assistant Jerome and I, and phew, it was so awesome. And on our very, very last all-nighter, you know, we're like up all night, where the museum's gonna open in the next day or so, and I'm coming home, the sun is fully lit, and Roth comes running around the corner, and he says there's been a terrorist attack. And as you know, everything changed, you know, everything. But we were here all together as this community. And this room became completed and it was a source of peace and harmony and meditation and quiet. And that community and that belonging and it became known as the chapel. This is how I walk normally. I was like, this is how I pretend walk, and then this is how I like for real walk. Uh, this is in Wynwood in Miami. It's an outdoor uh, open museum. And this is the ever famous Bowery Wall, which is on Houston and Bowery in Manhattan. And it's uh, one of the only walls that I know of that is allotted only for artists. There's no advertising ever. And I was so honored to be asked to paint. Mind you, it was during the polar vortex and it was freezing and it was insane, but I like that sort of endurance test that painting can be, you know, where it's like such a rush, like you're like, oh my God, it's an extreme sport, you know, like wah, and it's like so physically demanding. It's so psychologically demanding. And, probably damaging, but uh, it's such that risk, you know, that, that rush is such a huge flow of adrenaline, and it is so fun. So, painting and painting, a couple of days, and the wall was basically finished. You know, we uh, had, a couple, had a couple little finishing touches I wanted to do, and I arrived the next day to see this, or I le left it that, that way, and I arrived the next day, and all across the entire mural were huge graffiti tags, massive. Awesome, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I'm not gonna like cover it up because it really means like repainting the entire painting, but I'm also not gonna let it ride, you know? And, and honestly, like I wasn't offended, I didn't take it personally. Like these kids wanted to get up, I wanted to get up, here we are, so, I decided to kind of obscure their graffiti the way you would, uh, like the way the razzle-dazzle battleships back in the day when you'd look on the horizon and they would kind of become invisible. And I wanted that graffiti to become invisible, but yet somehow still there. There's still markings in there like, suck. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't even know, I don't even know. 
Uh, and then this is how the painting finished. And um, to be honest, I actually like it more than how it was before because it had this unpredictable nature. But you know, I seriously say that with so much hesitation because I don't want to invite anyone to, I guess you could call it like forcefully collaborate with me. I'd rather <laughs> collaborate at my, at my choosing. And this other phenomena happened where people would be walking by and they would constantly stop in their tracks and immediately like have this instinct to take a selfie. And those selfies went viral. And they became this like tourist destination that people would go want to see this wall. And mind you, it only ran four months. So this is a mural. This is sort of the final story that kind of brings it all together. No, it's not the final story. We've got plenty more. But uh, this is in Coney Island. It's a painting on a bunch of panels of wood. It ran through the summer and the winter, rain and snow. And I stored it after uh, about a year or so into my storage studio. And then a curator named Roger Gastman in Los Angeles decided to make this exhibition that was a survey of artists, activists, and uh, inside outside art, and invited me. So we repuzzled that same mural in a new configuration. Roger's like, it's done, it's good. I'm like, yeah, yeah it's good. It's like, I can walk away. Um, but I like to paint too much to just like have it be that easy and and for the previous like year at least, I was just like beating my head against the wall, like because something happened, and you all know what it is. Trump happened. <laughs> so there I was again, a woman, an immigrant, another, again. So I started painting into what was already there, and I started bringing out what became the four-letter word that described it all. The defiance, the empowerment, the sexuality, the, the risk of everything. And it, anyway, thank you for this collaboration. Thank you for trusting me. And I hope we all become in trust of all one another very soon. Thank you.